Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Jamie Catherwood, and I am an associate at O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, which is a quantitative long-only equity firm based out of Stamford, Connecticut. In addition to my day job, I am a full-blown financial history nerd and the CEO and publisher of InvestorAmnesia.com, which is a website dedicated to all things financial history. And given the nature of this conference, I'm delighted to speak to you all about the history of financial innovations and a few of the maybe uh, under, uh, undercovered financial innovations in history. So the first one that I want to begin with is the Drehim tablet of ancient Mesopotamia, which was discovered and it stems from 2100 BCE. And while today we have Python and R and other coding languages, this quite literal tablet was powered by cuneiform. You can think of it as the original coding language. And what the Dream tablet was, was an early financial planning calculator or tool that was used to forecast the growth of an asset, which in this case was a herd of cattle. So while today we use tools like Orion and others to calculate what our portfolio might be worth when we retire, and we use that to plan our kind of financial lives accordingly, this was forecasting the growth of the herd of cattle and its output or estimated output of milk and cheese. So instead of a dividend yield, you can think of that as the dairy yield. Um, and so you can imagine how useful this would be to a farmer even thousands of years ago, where he can kind of have an idea of what to expect in terms of future cash flow and uh, what the value of his herd would be in a decade's time. But like today, there were some problems with the model, specifically overly optimistic return assumptions. So while today there might be some advisors that tell their clients they can expect 11% return on their investment each year in perpetuity, um, I think most of us would say that is wildly over optimistic. And in this portfolio or in this tool, the error was down to the assumption that no cow in this herd of cattle would ever die. Uh, so while they were forecasting the growth of the cattle, they did not take into account that these cows had a set lifetime and would obviously die at some point. Um, so an early example of problems with models. This next one is a little bit wacky as well, but I think it's important um, to talk about, especially today in the age of cryptocurrencies. And this, what you're looking at here is an example of the rye stones on the Pacific island of Yap, which were these limestone disks that stood up to 12 feet tall, weighed 9,000 pounds, and were really used though, obviously not uh, in everyday exchange, but they were used in the economy to exchange for goods and services. And I think it's an excellent example of how a currency's value is derived from a community's belief in its value much more than any intrinsic value it may or may not possess. So people today say that Bitcoin is worthless because it has no intrinsic value, but I personally think that that kind of misses the point because it's more about whether a large enough group of people believe that Bitcoin holds value. Um, I mean, the dollar is just a piece of paper, but it's what the dollar represents that makes it valuable. And so uh, this was again an early example of this is no more no more ridiculous than Bitcoin. Um, and it's an early example of a wacky currency, but because people believed in it, it held value. Moving forward to something a little less wonky, we have the earliest stock market, which comes from the third century BC in Rome. In the picture here, you can see the three columns that are left over on the Roman forum from the temple of Castor. And the shares that were being traded here on this exchange were shares of government contractors which were essentially handling the tax collection services for the Roman Empire. Um, one interesting thing to note is that there was a quote from Cicero discussing the high valuations of these shares. And he's quoted saying that the shares had traded at a very high price. So uh, I, it would appear that Cicero was a value investor. But really three, well, not thousands of years later, the modern stock market that we would recognize today and is most clearly related to today's market stems from the 17th century in Amsterdam. Um, in 1602, the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, which is pictured here in the famous courtyard, it was opened and really for the majority of its early years was really just 
trading shares of the East India Company. So it's crazy today to think of an exchange that was really just trading one stock, but that was the reality at this time. Um, but even though it was only trading one stock, there was, there was a very extensive network of options markets, short sellers, futures markets, and it was really quite the modern uh, stock exchange and has a lot of clear precedence for today's market. Um, and so I think that even though this picture looks very outdated, much of what was going on there and the descriptions that we can find of the market at the time read just like they would read about the stock market today. Again, in Amsterdam, some hundred years later, we have the first investment vehicle or one of the early investment vehicles and certainly the first mutual fund. Um, the Unity Create Strength Fund was launched in 1774 by a Dutch broker named Abraham Van Ketwich. And what was interesting about this fund is that it was launched in the aftermath of a financial crisis in 1772 and 73, when the Dutch East India Company saw its share prices plummet. And because of how gargantuan the company was and how well it had done, many Dutch investors and Dutch banks and the financial system in general was heavily exposed to the company. And so when the company's share prices plummeted, so too did the portfolio values of all of these banks and investors. Many of the banks were actually brought to the brink of bankruptcy and a few of them went bankrupt. And so after this occurred, this Dutch broker thought to himself, I should offer, I should you know, come up with a product that would allow retail investors to hold a diversified portfolio that has broad market exposure so that they can kind of avoid being tied so heavily to the kind of swings of one specific stock. And so this fund really represents the first mutual fund, but also the first kind of passive bond index because it was an equally weighted portfolio across a range of different fixed income categories. And it was offered at a very low price, even by today's standards, of 20 basis points. Um, and one interesting thing to note about this fund, it might be where the phrase locking up your money comes from, because the three portfolio managers put all of these share certificates um, into a box so that with into an iron chest, I should say, rather, with three locks to prevent themselves from trading. And this required obviously all three portfolio managers to come with their key and unlock it at the same time in order to make any trades. So it was a way to prevent themselves from uh, falling victim to over trading. Flash forwarding another century, we have the ticker in 1867. Um, the anniversary of this was actually this month, the first uh, time it was introduced. And as you can see on the left there, the chart shows the rapid increase in ticker impressions between 1889 and 1901, that kind of hockey stick growth, if you will. Um, and although it seems like somewhat of a boring uh, innovation, perhaps, it was actually very important and it really revolutionized and democratized finance because before the ticker was introduced, you pretty much had to be at the stock exchange physically or right next to it in order to get real-time information about the stock market. And so this obviously put any firm not in Manhattan next to the exchange at a severe disadvantage and they had less lower quality information and it made it much more difficult to kind of handle clients assets and invest for yourself even. But once this was introduced, company, or brokerages around the country could suddenly connect to the kind of fast flowing information from the exchange through new cables and transatlantic systems. And so this ticker, although again, it seems kind of banal, it was really important to kind of revolutionizing the not only financial advice industry because advisors suddenly had a new like massive database of information, but it also improved the accuracy and quality of investment advice. However, we also know that when we as investors get our hands on increased data and more rapid data, we tend to over trade and get overwhelmed with real time information. So on the left, there's one of my favorite illustrations of a husband on vacation with his family. And instead of hanging out with them, he is off to the side just checking the ticker prices and seeing how his stocks are doing. And I think many of us would agree that if you swap out that newspaper and ticker machine for an iPhone, it would be a very familiar site today. Uh, and then on the right there, you can see a restaurant near the stock exchange advertising the fact that you could watch the ticker tape roll by as you ate your lunch, just if you couldn't bear to be away from the market for more than 30 minutes. 
And this is one of my favorite examples of the ticker tape and illustrations of the day pointing out again, the uh, increased speculation and negative aspects of the ticker. Um, as you see a stock promoter there putting out his net to collect the money of uh, manic investors that are just looking to hurl their money at the speculative stocks of the day. So I know that was a quick presentation with a lot of information, but I hope you enjoyed it. And if you would like to check out more of this content and learn more about financial history, you can check out my website at investoramnesia.com and check out my Twitter at the same handle of at investoramnesia. Thank you so much.